listening to Michael Savage Archives on Really Big Something Channel. August 18th, 2009. I actually was going to pick another rock and roll song today, but it was gonna, every day another one goes through my head. Keep it playing. Let me see. If, oh, forget it. Turn it off. All right. Robert Novak dead. Now, I didn't know Robert Novak. I hope he went to uh, the place where we all hope to go and not to the other place where liberals go. But he's getting a lot of play. We can't say anything bad about the dead unless they lived in San Francisco and... You know, all right, so it brings up your mortality. What are they going to say about you when you die and this and that? And lo and behold, lo and behold, my cardiologist sent me my lab results. I'm supposed to see him tomorrow. Then I don't have any cardiac trouble, but I go once a year because I got upside down lipids. And you say, what are you crazy talking about your blood lipids on the air? Yes, because I'm going to lead to a medical point that may be of some value to some of you out there who are a little concerned. Uh, about your uh, cholesterol, for example. And so many Americans are being sold on Lipitor and Lipitor-like drugs who may not need them. And I want to talk about that for a minute because there are other things that you might be able to do that are not drug-related. But the society is drugged to death, whether they're on antidepressants when they don't need them or they're on anti-cholesterol medications when they may not need them. The country is drugged to death. And what's interesting is it ties right into the health care debate because you'll notice that the drug companies are all in favor of Obamacare. Now, why would the drug companies be in favor of Obamacare? Because it will give unlimited prescription drugs to everybody in America, and they'll make trillions of dollars. You understand how this works? You understand how this all works together? Follow the money. So let's go back to the fact that, oh, yeah, drugs are lifesavers. Don't get me wrong. But they should be used as a last resort, not on a recreational basis, as is being done in this country. Many of the American people today are practicing recreational medicine. Everybody in this country thinks something's wrong with them and gets a prescription for it. Now, in some cases, I said, RXs can save your life. But in most cases, they're useless or dangerous, okay? Now, having laid the groundwork for that, I want to go back again to what I'm talking about. For years, I've struggled with upside-down uh, VAP uh, profiles, my LDL high, my HDL low, my overall cholesterol through the ceiling, triglycerides high. Whatever you look at, it's upside down. So if a normal person got this, they would run and say, I, I do anything because I think I'm going to die. But it's been like this for 20 years. But I'm not dead. And thus far, I haven't had a heart attack. So it doesn't make sense. Unless you get an even more refined test which I got. Now remember, I come from a family of early death by coronary heart disease. I don't want to give you the ages and turn it into a joke. But I've been running scared about a heart attack since I'm 30, maybe 20, which is what drove me into the jungles of the South Seas, collecting plants, drove me to get a PhD in epidemiology and nutrition, drove me to research and write books on health before I went into radio. I'll never forget when I entered radio in 1994, I said, this is probably going to kill me younger than I normally would go, but it'll be worth it. And, you know, every day is a miracle to me, but I'm still here 15 years later, and the stress level is as high as it could be. You have to say, well, how the hell does a guy live like this with this kind of stress? People have said to me, I blow off steam on the air, so therefore I'm alive. All right, that's one way to look at it. It's probably folklorically true. But let me go back to blood chemistry per se. You all know about cholesterol. And you're supposed to keep it low. Well, that's not 100% valid because there are societies where there's very high total cholesterol in the blood and the people don't get heart attacks. And, and so then the people started looking at LDL and HDL, the good and bad cholesterol that you know about. So let's look at the uh, uh, bad cholesterol, LDL, low-density lipoproteins. Why are, are, is it so-called the bad cholesterol, LDL, low-density lipoproteins? Because they're small particles that are thought to penetrate arterial walls and begin to cause plaque formation. Now, why would nature have designed the uh, production of LDL to begin with? Why would a human being produce low-density lipoprotein? In other words, there was a reason that nature had bodies produce this substance. Certainly, there are dietary factors, but there's a natural phenomenon that goes on as well. And that is, as a person gets older, their arteries become damaged. 
in other words, the vascular wall becomes weak and micro fissures or cracks begin to develop in the endothelial vascular wall. And what the body does in an attempt to patch up these fissures in the wall is the body produces cholesterol, right? And it produces a relative of cholesterol called LPA, lipoprotein A. Now, the problem is both cholesterol and LPA are very sticky, and it makes them perfect for the job. It's like a glue, right? And you, you've been taught, get rid of that glue, because you don't want that glue to clog up your arteries, and it makes sense to do that. But you have to understand something. The body may overproduce cholesterol and overproduce LPA uh, in its patching, and the patching ability will then aggregate and form a plaque that leads to vascular occlusion or hardening of the arteries, okay? So here's the thing. You may have high cholesterol, but you may also have LPA, which is high, and LPA is sticky, cholesterol is sticky, and so they adhere to the arterial wall, and you want to watch out because you'll clog your arteries. But what if, what if you have high cholesterol and low LPA? Lipoprotein A, it's a major independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Follow me for a minute. Follow what I'm saying to you. When you have your blood cholesterol tested, you all get LDL, HDL, VLDL, you get triglycerides. Most of you know about these values. But have you been tested for LPA, cholesterol, lipoprotein A? Remember what I said to you. Lipoprotein A is manufactured in the liver, and it carries cholesterol into the arteries, which may have cracks in them. But if you have too high an LPA, it carries the LDL, the low-density lipoproteins, right through the arterial wall and causes the plaque that you don't want. But what can you do if you have high LPA? The answer is very, very little. There are no drugs or medicines to effectively lower your LPA. So what do you do if you have a low LPA? You thank God for your genetics. My uh, uh, cholesterol levels are completely screwed up. L very high LDL, very low HDL. Uh, very high total cholesterol. But you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. My latest lab report came back two hours ago, and I have a 0.0, .0 LPA cholesterol, which is almost statistically or medically impossible. In fact, my cardiologist is calling the lab to make sure that there's been no mistake. The ideal here is to have a very low LPA, minus 0. It's the only reason I'm still living. In other words, this is a genetically inherited a component. You can't modify it very easily. The only things you can do to lower your LPA, which is what you want to do, is take uh, saturated levels of vitamin C, lysine, and proline, because they are building blocks of collagen. But I don't want to get into great details about that. Just understand that you should, you should circulate great amounts of vitamin C in your blood, as well as 800 IUs of vitamin E. I don't listen to what any quack tells you. Vitamin C is very important for your health in many, many different ways. Forget what the quacks tell you that it doesn't work or it's dangerous. They're liars. They want to push you into the drug, into the drug field. Now, let me go back to what I'm saying to you. <clears throat> By all statistics, with my cholesterol, LDL, and HDL, I should have had a heart attack by now. I'm sorry to talk like this, but I'm talking to you like the way I think about it. LPA cholesterol is the It's zero. If I had an LPA, by and large, over the LPA, other than taking lots of vitamin, vitamin C. But it's genetic. So I must have inherited from my mother her LPA levels. She died at 88. My dad, may rest in peace, died at 57. I'm hoping that my LPA is inherited, uh, it was inherited from my mother, but I definitely got it from someone. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is that it's all tied into Obamacare. The reason it's tied into Obamacare, I will try to uh, lead you to that right now. The reason you are not tested for LPA, which is a major independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, is because currently there is no medicine or drugs to effectively lower your LPA. Moreover, what if your doctor said your, your cholesterol levels are screwed up, take Lipitor, but then he said, but you have very low LPA and you don't need, cholesterol, uh, and you don't need Lipitor. It would cut into the drug industry's profits, wouldn't it? What if you found out you had very low LPA as I do? You probably wouldn't need Lipitor-like compounds. You understand what I'm saying to you? I'm not expecting anyone to call on this. In fact, I expect everyone hung up by now because they want to hear me talk about uh, liberals and conservatives. or uh, I, I don't want to do a DNC, RNC, all of, but I won't do it. This is what I'm interested in right now. And I will get to the news maybe later. Maybe I should go back to what I was originally going to do today, which is this.
was on my bicycle today, and I called my producer, and I said, here's what I'm going to do. The, the Arabs have a saying, if you cannot improve upon the silence of the desert, do not speak. So I think that's what I will do. Since I cannot improve upon the silence of the desert, I can see that science and medicine is of no interest to my audience. And since I cannot improve upon the silence of the desert, I will now turn the show over to you. It's your show. I have nothing more to say. You call me at 1-800-449-8255 if you want to talk about anything, whether it be health topics. Don't ask me how to get a, uh, an erection. I'm not going to answer the question. Health topics that I can answer. I really would rather not do it. I'm not going to answer any health questions. Forget it. Politics, science, poetry, art, meatballs, whatever. I don't want to talk about anything else right now. I'm not interested. Except my book, which you don't want to hear about. You want me to talk about Band in Britain? That it came out yesterday on my website. It'll be printed in about six weeks for delivery. And already the sales are through the roof. You want me to talk about how happy I am that you rushed to michaelsavage.com to see the secret, to get the book, to see the secret emails that were found through the Freedom of Information Act? I mean, this should be a book that every liberal has on his, on his bookshelf. Every liberal should thank me for fighting for free speech. Every liberal, but there are very few liberals. There are too many progressives who, frankly, are just a front for the Communist Party USA, okay? Okay, phone number, 1-800-449-8255, michaelsavage.com. If you want to talk about LDL, HDL, VLDL, triglycerides, apolipoprotein A or LPA, call somebody else, take two aspirin, and I'll be right back. There goes the one I love. Oh my God, it's all about heart, heart and soul, isn't it? There goes the girl. That's why people love me. They hate my politics, but they love me. Go figure. I wasn't worthy. In some cases, they they love their politics, but they hate the person. Go figure that one out. This is not the good version. There's a better one. Than that. This is much too slow. This is for people in a Barker lounge or on some medication. Don't we have uh, Tony Martin or one of those, There Goes My Heart? There was a better version that my father liked. And I stuff to listen to it at DeSoto. I wanted to hear rock and roll. He'd play that. What are you going to do? The Trun's Meat Factory in Kosciuszko Bridge. You could die in the August. The smell of the rendered fat. I think today it's an art gallery for very sophisticated people who moved from uh, Westchester to leave their parents and, uh, you know, do the cool thing and live where their grandfathers fled from. Uh, how the world changes. The grandfather lands, the great-grandfather lands from Eastern Europe and can't get out of the Lower East Side. The parents struggle to get out of the Lower East Side, the slum, in other words, and move to Long Island and New Jersey, and they move. Then the grandchild grows up and can't wait to get away from New Jersey and move back to the slum. So they can go clubbing till 3 in the morning and make nothing of their life and wind up back where their grand great grandfather was, which is an immigrant in their own country, like a loser off the boat. I saw a show last night. I wanted to throw my glass of water through the screen. It was called Intervention, where they take every crank drug addict in the world and turn him into a hero. I wanted to, I wanted to strangle the kid. He was in, uh, a nose ring, a junkie. The father was protecting him in the house. The mother wanted to move back to Peru. She couldn't take it anymore. Good, nice middle-class family. The father could make you cry. He was such a nice guy. And he wouldn't acknowledge that the kid had a problem. And, and kissing this kid's behind, I wanted to grab the kid and shake him and pull the nose ring out with a plier. I wanted to take a plier and pull it out of his nose, smack him in the face, and say, get out of my house for them. But the father wouldn't do it. And they turn him into heroes. The minute he says he'll go into treatment, they slap him on the back like he already... He, he was a parachutist and won the, the Medal of Honor because he's going to go into treatment. What a country. All I could think of is that the father, if he had smacked the kid around and taken the needle and thrown it out the window and stepped on it with his foot and said, if you ever bring drugs in this house again, I'll throw you in the gutter. That could have stopped a dead cold in the beginning. But the father indulged him. He was a, what do you call it, a, co, uh, a codependent. I, I can't take the weakness, the weakness. The country's filled with weaklings. What happened to the strength of America? That's why I'm talking about my illness. Because if you want to go there, I'll do it. That's all. May as well be about my weaknesses. Austin, uh, line four, you're on the Savage Nation. Hey, Mike. Uh, first of all, thanks for doing this show every day. I know it wears on you, uh, but you're doing God's work, and we really appreciate it. I uh, wanted to thank you for the opening segment. I'm a, I'm a relatively young guy. I'm in my mid-30s. i got high triglycerides. And, of course, first thing the doctor wants to do a prescription and I'm fine. Right. They want to get you on Lipitor or Lipitor like drugs, then they'll want to put you on Prozac related drugs and turn you into a total a total victim of the medical establishment. 
Definitely, but, you know, thanks to you and your... Uh, what, what well, uh, now, wait a minute. There may be cases where you should be on medication. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, you could try diet, exercise, and vitamins as a first step. It's certainly less toxic than going into a drug world. Thanks for the call. I know what's coming. I told you. Before I was in talk radio, I was a an author of health books. Popular health books. I, they did well. I would do book tours, five, ten city tours. They were they were interesting. And every time I would do a book tour and go on a radio show, I remember to this day, wherever I went, the same thing would happen. All the men would call about was, can you help me get an erection and my hair is falling out? They didn't care about cancer. They didn't care about heart disease. Nothing. All the men wanted was perennial use, so to speak. Well, this is why I don't like to do health shows anymore. I don't want to do a health show today. Please. Please, can somebody call these people and tell them to leave me alone? I said, if you can't improve upon the uh, silence of the desert, don't say anything. But uh, you want to talk about why the medical establishment wants to test you for everything and wants to show that you're an anomaly, uh, rather that you are uh, statistically at risk of this disease or that? You may say, well, it's not as nefarious as that. There are drugs that can help. You're right. There are drugs that can help. And there are very wonderful doctors out there. Don't get me wrong. But we are an over-medicated society. We're an overly neurotic society about every little kvitch and fetch and pain and this and that. How did your great-grandfather live so long? Probably died at 30. Savage. It is the Savage Nation. The middle of August. Late August already. Most normal people are on vacation. They're in psycho land, drunk every day. What are they doing on vacation? Sit in the room. What are they going out for ice every two? Ice. That is so 1950s. The bucket with the ice. Is that what you're supposed to do? Go and go in a room and sit and drink whiskey? I don't get it. I mean, why go anywhere to do that? I, anyway, look to each his own. I'm a, tr you know, in that regard, I'm really a libertarian. I've told you that I'm a sexual libertarian. I've said that a hundred times a, a week, but no one seems to hear me. I don't care what you do to stimulate your various body parts, as long as children are left alone and you stay away from marriage. I don't really care. That's all. How hard is that to figure out? So, what am I want to doing here? I'm sitting here drinking tea, doing a radio show. I have a cup. I have a tea. The cup is a naval cup with a wide bottom. I like naval items. Nautical and naval items are my my hobby, okay? This is a cup I got from a guy in Seattle. It says, daily flogging will continue until the crew's morale improves. There. That's interesting. Daily flogging will continue until the crew's morale improves. That's my idea of how to raise... I take a child out of being a junkie. Oh, how come you... Why do they coddle them for? You throw the drugs out the window, you step on the hypodermic needle with your boot, and you throw the kid in the street, and that's all. Don't enable him. The, the first sign you got you to strike back, the first sign you strike back, the minute you coddle that child, you're, co you're helping him become a junkie. The, the minute you coddle him and understand him, he's finished. You've ruined him. That is the world I am, uh, that's the world I was brought up in. Now you say, it's too harsh for the world of today. And you know, you may be right. I mean, thinking about it, the world has changed, the society has changed. Take a look at what we have in the White House. Can you imagine a man like this in the White House 20 years ago? Impossible. How could so many people have fallen for this joker? How is it possible? All right, there were Democrats who were legitimate candidates who had experience and we knew who they were and, and with whom we could trust the country to hand it to them. I wouldn't have liked their policies necessarily, but I didn't have doubts about where they were born, where their loyalties lied. But this guy out of nowhere, he even beat the Hillary Clinton machine. How'd this happen? You say to yourself, why? Because we have created an entire generation of fools, fools, idiots, to be fooled by this guy. How do you take the most far left radical senator in history? You know, you've got to even look at Barack Obama's senatorial history. How do you become a senator? How is, why the Chicago machine make him a senator? Think of Blagovich, think of Rahm Emanuel, think of Al Capone. Now you have him in the, in the, in the presidency and you don't watch The Sopranos? I say to myself every day, no wonder my cholesterol is upside down. But uh, here we are, here we are. Conservatives now outnumber liberals in all 50 states, says Gallup poll. You hear this? In every state of the union, conservatives self-identify more conservatives than liberals in all 50 states. You would think by turning on the news that 90% of Americans are liberal. They all can't wait for Joseph Stalin's Russia to appear, according to MSNBC. More snotty nonsense by chicks. That includes the men on it, including the guy who urinates. They say he does. I'm sorry. The tall guy with the glasses, they claim he urinates under the table. That's the rumor inside the uh, 
the uh, uh, the uh, commentary mill. His, sh- his legs shake while he broadcasts, and they have to mop up the floor after it. I don't know if it's true. That's what they say. That's what they say. I haven't any idea if there's any truth to that. So let's take the call. As I said to you, uh, one, um, you, I told you what I said already. What did I say already? I forgot what I said. I'm, I'm, I need a vacation. I launched the book on the website yesterday. You're buying the book. I can rela- I need to go away. I need to go away. But here's my dilemma. Uh, everything I, uh, uh, go, where I want to go, I, I nix in my head before I even... In other words, before the plan, I'll go, before I finish the sentence, I'll go. Bing, it's don't go. Why? Because I've traveled to everywhere I ever wanted to go in my life. Remember, I was a plant collector, an exotic plant collector, uh, in the 1970s and 80s. Actually, going back to 1969, that's before Al Gore even knew what, what the Earth was. I was collecting plants in the in the rainforest, trying to rescue them from from extinction. I'm not asking for a halo. It's just a fact of reality. I earned a real PhD uh, based upon some of this research, based upon other work. So what I'm getting at is how much more travel does a person need? How many of you really like going to a hotel? It's just a place, you know, why is that a destination? I don't, I don't think we have any advertisers that are travel agencies. They will, before I continue on this track. <laughs> no, thank you. They all dropped me. All right, so I can continue now. Uh... I told you what happened. We went to Cancun because the family is normal. They like to travel. I got to admit it. They're normal people. They they enjoy it. I'm, you know, maybe it's, I'm getting older. I don't know. You know, I'm getting more cantankerous, more difficult. They do say, now that you think about it, that when people get older, they get set in their ways. I used to hear that when I was young. I didn't know what it meant. Yeah, I hear what you mean. Like setting your way. You don't want to do certain things. Say, no, I don't do this. And you won't. You're inflexible. That is true. Then maybe I'm becoming inflexible. In that regard, but okay, oh, so they want to go. So I went. We went to Cancun, uh, and they know that I'm picky. So God bless them. My son got me the top floor and unit windows both sides, so the wind would blow through, so I wouldn't complain about a lack of air. Perfect room over the beach, right? Wrong. I laid down in the bed like wood. That now remember, I made a pre-call to the manager. You know, and he spoke fairly good English, and I spoke in broken English. Blah, 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 senor, I get with the senor job till I wanted to break something. And I said, you know, no perfume in the room, no hair shirts on the bed, soft mattress. See, si, senor, si, senor. I get in the room, it smelled like, uh, let us put it to you this way. It was like um, that Orson Welles movie. What was that one, Beowulf, the Orson Welles movie? A touch of evil. The room smelled like touch of evil had occurred in it. And they had oversprayed it with, like, bad perfume. So I said, now nah, you're imagining. Come on, stop already. Don't say anything to the family because enough. You drove them crazy coming down here. Well, I lay on the bed. It's a rock. So right away I say to the guy, you got to change and put a mattress pad on. Five people with the si senor, knock, knock, si senor. And they open it up. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth what happened. They pull the, the, the cover off the bed. A blood stain the size of a dead pig on the mattress. I said, that's it, I'm getting out. Take the mattress out of here. I, I started yelling, get the mattress out of this room. Now, either there was a murder or a, deli- a a birth in the room prior to my arrival. But I'm giving an example. What did I need this for? Why do I want to travel to exotic locations to experience H1N8 flu, meaning Mexican flu? I'm sorry, I'm trying to tell you not. I mean, it is the origin. You're not allowed to say that anymore. In fact, they're so proud of it that they erected a statue to the kid who originated the disease, who had the first case of the disease in Mexico. It's interesting how they glor. It is an interesting thing. The kid, you say, don't say it, it's racist, say Mexican flu. Well, first of all, it's accurate. It would be, it would be somewhat racist if you made it up and it wasn't accurate, but it's dead accurate. It started in Mexico because the first known case in the human was in, uh, in the interior of Mexico. They're so proud of the kid, they built a statue to him in his hometown. <laughs> I think that's cute, isn't it? The town that gave the world swine flu. <laughs> Maybe they could go there. People could start traveling to that town. <laughs> oh, God, what a world. So it gets darker. I don't want to sound like... I don't want to get in the air every day and complain that society's no good, no bombers are socialists. But, you know... Uh, things are getting worse. They're not getting better. Like here in San Francisco, you think you couldn't go lower? It just went lower. We have a supervisor, one of the city supervisors who can't get a job anywhere else. He's trying to pass a law that would shield illegal immigrant youths from prosecution by the federal, deportation by the federal government. Perfect way to have kids as drug runners. 
In other words, if you catch a kid under a certain age running drugs or murdering somebody, this clown wants to make sure he can't be deported. Can you believe I live in a city like this? By definition, the supervisor is enabling criminals. He should be arrested by the federal government. Isn't there a limit to what a supervisor can do? Read about it. It's on michaelsavage.com. Then order my book. Okay? I can't believe how worse it gets. Is there anybody in the city of San Francisco who works for the city who actually represents taxpayers? I don't know of one official who represents the actual taxpayers and citizens. Every one of them represents illegal aliens and some kind of nefarious special interest. So, anywho, here we are, Savage Nation. Or what is the rate right now? August 18th, 2009. You know what the news is. The guy died. God bless him. You can't say anything bad about him, and I won't. I never, I never paid attention to him. I found he was very sour and very Republican. It was too Republican for me. He was just like an old Republican. Like he, he typified like old Republican to me. They say, well, what's wrong with being an old Republican? Nothing. Okay, nothing. He wasn't my cup of tea. There was nothing delightful. No effervescence. Like flat, uh, sel- it's like seltzer without bubbles. The whole thing. Republicans is like seltzer without, without carbon dioxide. When you think about it, it's like. Do you want sparkling or flat? I love that when you go to a restaurant, they build up the bill. Do you want sparkling or flat? I said, I'll take tap water with ice. Because we have very good tap water in San Francisco. They haven't yet found a way to tax it or destroy it. Hetch Hetchy water. As you get me the Hetch Hetchy 09, if you don't mind. The snow melt from last season I would like to drink. It's much tastier than bottled water, I got to tell you. Delicious, delightful. My dog likes it. If the dog likes it, why shouldn't I like it? But I have a filter. Did you ever look at those water filters that we're talking about, uh, health-related? You think they're crack, uh, quackery? You're wrong. I have like a Moen filter in the you know, old-fashioned in the uh, in the sink. I don't have an expensive, you know, twelve million dollar unit in the in the guts of the water system. This is a tap thing that you put in, and as it comes out, the filter catches the the heavy metals. It's amazing when you when it's full. It's a zero percent left, and you take it out. It's heavy. So you say, so it's heavy, it's trapping the, the mercury, the lead, the antimony. It's trapping all the heavy metals that you really don't want in your cells. You know, I mean, it does work. I mean, the dogs, thank God, aren't getting it. I got one dog I love. It's a circus dog. Could do anything. It could have been in the circus, this dog. The other dog, a lunatic, a maniac. It's handicapped mentally, so I don't get mad at it. A lunatic dog. One is 10 pounds. We got the other one to be a goat for the good do- The good dog's 10 or 11 pounds, normal toy poodle. I don't call him toy because I don't like the word toy. Just like a condensed poodle. Then we got him like a, a dog to play with, like the goat for the horse. Remember in The Sopranos, the goat that they, after the horse was set on fire, the goat was going around. It was very sad outside the stables. It was very, it was touching. Speaking of The Sopranos, I'll tell you the truth. I, I watched the first season opening of a Mad Men, a stiff. Now they're getting autistic already. Watch out when the when the producers and directors suddenly want to show you how smart they are and how, how creative they are. It's the end of the series. It was like The Sopranos. It was good for four or five years. Then already they went into dream sequences, a stiff, not enough murder, and not enough sex. It killed the series. It was like when, when Woody Allen stopped being Woody Allen and started trying to be, uh, who was he wanting to be? That Swedish director? Forgot his name already. Who remembers? Not, no, not Charlie McCarthy's, uh, I'm joking, you know, yeah, Ingmar Bergman. He wanted to be Bergman, right, Ingmar Bergman. Ingmar Bergman, was, but he tried to be like a very famous director and artistic. His movies stunk. And the only movies he ever did were good was when he played like the Schlemiel schmuck. Everyone liked Woody Allen playing the schmuck because it was a stereotype of the schmuck from New York, so everyone laughed at him. But the minute he wanted to show how smart he was and how serious he was, his movies stank. It's the same with what went on with The Sopranos. They were fabulous when they stuck to the main thematic, you know, gangster New Jersey and psychotherapy, the wife with the outfits, the dysfunctional son, excellent. Everyone liked it. Then the minute they got into, like, season five, it was awful, terrible. And the series started to die. It was awful. Same thing now with Mad Men, in my estimation, my analysis. Why? If you watched it at all. The first three seasons were really astoundingly good. Mad Men. Already now they go into season four, disc one. I watched it Sunday because they sent it in advance. Now they already have the dream sequence. They're already into the, they're moving into the sexuality a little too much. They went on and on with the stewardess 
from Pan Am with the naked, with the garter belt and the slip. They're already pandering. No good. Finished. I'll be back. Just like the walls are I'm playing Christmas go. music because it's a hot, a hot August day. Boring like doldrums. The I can't wait. I can't wait for the days to get shorter and the darker early. I like dark at 4.35. <laughs> so I can eat dinner. I can't eat while the sun's out. I can go blind. Last night was like forever. Show was over. I got in the van. I have a, like a camper van I take out in the summer. I went riding around with the dog. I go down to Sausalito. That's a beautiful waterfront town. And there's no one around. I sit by the water. I look at the boats. I look at the... There's no one there. It's like gloomy. I like it, though. And then I couldn't till a tick-tock, tick-tock, waiting for the sun to set. I go in a restaurant figuring it'll be down by the time I'm out. I come out. I almost went blind. It hit me right in the eyes. It's gone down behind Mount Tamalpais. Right at the wrong way as I got into the car. I couldn't get away from it. I felt like I was being pursued by the sun. I, I can't get away from it. I can't take it anymore. I can't wait for winter and dark. So I'm thinking, where on earth today is it winter? Is there a place? I mean, I know about, you know, the other side. Like, if I went to Peru right now, would it be cold? Where can I go right now where it's snowing? Where's it snowing right now? I'll go there for vacation. I wouldn't go there. Remember the uh, the thing in the 1950s in the Antarctic? That was a great movie. I always like the same. I should have been an Antarctic scientist and lived in a Quonset hut with uh, other scientists, like with pipes and be. <laughs> what do they do in that Quonset hut for six months at a time? They're not allowed to drink if you work for the NS National Science Foundation or NASA. Now you know, like work. You sit in the. What do they do at night there? Oh, I'm going to sleep now, John. Oh, you got the shift in the morning. Y'all. Well, they just lay down and go to sleep? How do they deal with that? They have to be on medication. I would think that all of the government scientists and those and those Quonsidots, they're drugged. There's no way they can get through a winter like that. It's always winter there. Because I was thinking about cold. I was trying to like put my mind in that state. So I was thinking about Christmas time when I was a teenager. And I worked in my friend's father's clothing store Christmas time. I don't know where it was. Lefferts Boulevard, Jamaica Avenue, something like under an L. But I remembered this. The cheerfulness in the air at Christmas time in my friend's father's clothing store. Every, you know, like the door would ring. It was right out of Dickens. The door, it had a bell on the door and it was like, it was like a li- not really upscale, but not downscale, but a little on the upper scale. Like they had, um, men's cologne in a section. It's an age when clothing stores had men's cologne, such as Old Spice. Now that was exotic for me because in my house, um, cologne on men was frowned upon. Oh, and- no one was allowed. No man with cologne was allowed allowed around my house. He was like, hey, what, what's he wearing cologne for, you know? But anyway, <clears throat> so guys, you hear like the bell would ring, it was like Dickens. Everybody was happy, cheerful. Remember those age? Does anyone feel that anymore shopping anywhere on earth? The happiness in the air, the cheerfulness around Christmas time. And, you know, they taught you how to make a package. The kids can't even make a package. I buy something in Macy's. They throw it, they roll it up and throw it in a bag. I swear to God, I buy a pair of pants. The schmuck rolls it up like a ball and throws it in, in a bag. I said, hey, that's not a way to put a pair of pants in. Put it on a damn hanger for me. Well, we don't have any hangers. I said, well, go buy one. I'm not taking it in a bag. Like a, They give you bags that look like garbage bags. You come out of Macy's, it makes you look like you're homeless. I'm ashamed. I got a dash to the trunk of the car. But you go in that store and, you know... D- they showed you like a shirt, whatever, shirt, scarf, whatever. Everyone was happy. There'll be 1992, 95, ring it up, ding, ding. And the kid, I was the kid, and you'd package it properly. They taught you right away how to package, how to make a package, a proper way to fold, like craft paper, because it had to look good. How many people had to make a package anymore? I don't even, a, a simple thing like that. You say, why are you talking about it? Because I don't know why am I talking about it. I like making a package and giving it to him with scotch tape. You like pull, zip, and you gave it to him with a bow on it. Everyone went out happy. There was no anger. Not everybody was pissed off at everybody. They didn't assume you were cheating them, that the man was out to rob them. They bought a shirt. They bought a scarf. They bought a glove. You wrapped it. They paid, and that was the end of the story. They didn't come back after it was used. They didn't use it in an orgy and say it doesn't fit. Give me my money back like they do today in the stores. No wonder they're going out of business. Why a returns policy? Clothing stores today, department says, have a returns policy. It is so ridiculous. It's worse than the uh, publishing business. You ever a publishing business like this? Uh, the, the, you, you, they sell a book, and, and you return it. The, the, and the print has to eat it. The publisher eats it. No wonder they're going out of business. Who set up a business like that? 
They print 10,000 copies, send them out to the stores. They don't sell 6,000. They return them to the store. And they return them to the printer, and he has to burn them. I, to the store, rather. I don't understand how anybody makes a living doing that. That's why I say, you know, they're, they're out of business. Bad business management. They don't know anything about business publishers. Nothing. Zero. Today, it's Internet. It's Internet. It's, uh, that's the whole way to sell a book. And luckily, banned in Britain. See, it's all an ad. That's all my whole life. And that's not true. Come on. But uh, there it was. It was nice. The store. What was the name of that lime water with straw in the bottle? Like lime. I saw it in a bad clothing store yesterday. Like a big fake bottle of it. A display size. Ugh. I would, who would buy anything in that store? Like a fake lime bottle. Savage. You are listening to Michael Savage Archives on Really Big Something Channel. Lime water in a straw bottle. Old Spice. Packaging. Happiness. Christmas time. Welcome to the Savage Nation. It's a different America. Different time. That's all. Today everyone's angry. Even when they shop, they're mad. You ever see women come out of stores? They buy, even if they buy expensive... Why are they angry? What, where did the pissed off attitude come from? Everyone's angry over something. I'm angry all the time. I mean, I'm just asking why. What are we all angry about? Why are we mad? Why is everyone angry at everybody? Give me the underwear. All right. Thank you. The only place that are nicer in Asian restaurants when the libs go in there and they bow. They bow down. They can put their hands together like they're in some movie. I don't understand that part. The only people that are nice to are illegal immigrants. They speak broken languages, but the libs are nice only to illegal aliens. But everyone else, they hate. They hate every other American. The white liberal is the most hypocritical creature on the planet. I've never seen anything like it. Hatred that, that pours out of them. Which is basically why I want to go uh, to to so a cold place now. You say, what does that have to do with anything? It's pure. The snow, the purity, the idea of the purity, a snowfield. But I don't. I'll tell you why I don't go. Even in the winter, I don't go. I talk about it like I can't wait for the winter. And yet, I haven't been in Lake Tahoe in ten, fifteen years. Do you know why? I used to love it. I stopped going when they invented the snowmobile. I won't go. What is the point of hiking in the outback when the schmuck go by? <laughs> The day Honda invented those machines, that was the end of the, of the wilderness. Also, I was on a beach in, in Florida not too long ago. I swear to God, another invasion of privacy, another disturbing of the peace. Uh, they have schmucks now flying around with parasails with motors on them on a beach. You're on a beach to hear the waves. These guys are allowed to do it. I begged the police to stop them, and the police did their job. They tried to. There's no ordinance to prevent a moron from taking off with a motorized parasail. They deliver drugs with that from Tijuana now into the border, but they're allowed to fly around beaches and threaten people. Who would do a thing like that? Everywhere you go on the planet, there's somebody trying to get under your skin and disturb you. Don't tell me they're doing it because they love the sheer joy of motor or whatever in the backwoods. What do you do that for? Everything's wrecked. So I stay home. I bicycle or go hike where no one is or go on a ride at the end of the day when no one's around. I like to eat in restaurants at the end of the day. Like not just before closing because that's, that's a stress on the staff. Not exactly just before closing because you're going to wind up with bad food and, and a hostile staff. But let's say they close at 10, you want to eat at 9. Don't get there at a quarter to 10 and expect to be treated well. I, you know, I was a busboy. I was a waiter. I was a lifeguard. I was a factory worker. I know what it is to, to labor. You know, don't, don't think, you know, so they don't like you if you come in at a quarter to ten. I like when it's dark and the kiddies are home on Ritalin and that's the time to eat. When they've been drugged so the parents can take their drugs. That's the time when you can go and, <laughs> I'm joking. Come on. I'm just pulling. Certain things I say, I do it for effect or to get your, you'll get your goat. That's all. You want me to do politics? Then call me with a political question. You want me to do personal? Then call me with a personal question. I probably won't. <laughs> I probably won't answer it. I'm giddy today because the lipoprotein A came back to zero. If you just tuned in, you missed a great hour. Every other number upside down. High cholesterol, bad LDLs, bad LFD. Everything was upside down except lipoprotein A, which is zero. Which I don't think is. There's got to be something wrong. I know it was going to be low. Be I, shut up already with that. I know it was going to be low. But uh, I didn't know it would be zero. How could it be zero? It's impossible to be zero. It's zero. That's inherited. That explains why I can abuse myself with food and still not die. 
No, I don't. I watch my, I've watched everything I've eaten for 35 years. And my tissues are saturated with ascorbic acid. Floating in ascorbic acid and vitamin E. Floating. Saturated. Super saturated with ascorbic acid. Because Linus Pauling was a gargantuan compared to the Lilliputians at the Mayo Clinic. Who have uh, spent their entire career trying to debunk Linus Pauling. It seems that they only, the only studies they want to do are to debunk Linus Pauling, to make a vitamin C doesn't work. The only thing that works is the, qu- the quacks who killed Ernest Hemingway. I never forgave the Mayo Clinic because he was, he was clinically depressed, Ernest Hemingway. If you studied him, which I did, because I revered him. He was like a, a hero of mine. Tense, good looking women with horse faces, uh, shiksa upscale. Everything was, everything was upscale hunting with women who were like hunting outfits. I know one in my family who wore a hunting outfit, but, like that kind of woman wore hunting outfits, fishing outfits, and he was in a tent with them and then the Kilimanjaro drinking in a tent. Whoever heard of it? Then eventually, years later, he becomes depressed from the booze or whatever. So they try to take him for treatment. They take him to the Mayo Clinic. They give him electroshock therapy. He can't write anymore. His mind doesn't work. So the next time they take him for another electroshock th- treatment, he walks out of the clinic and tries to walk into the propeller of the private plane because he didn't want to live anymore because his mind didn't work. That, that's, you know, that to me was an example of what was wrong, everything wrong with the psychotherapeutic profession. You can't drug everything out of a person. So that, may, that may be why I'm angry. I don't know. That could, <laughs> what? But it, it goes back to just stream of consciousness. Don't get excited. Don't try to make it all connect because it won't. I'm talking here. When I start to talk, I have a gift to connect things up that don't actually connect. But in a weird way, they could connect if you actually drew a line. Through them, there's some connection that I can't figure out yet. You'll have to do it uh, when uh, Boswell comes along. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Brian, thanks for waiting. You're on the Savage Nation. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Um, I'm an addicted liberal to your show. And um, I'm disgusted by the fact that your book's not only banned in Britain, but further disgusted that it's banned on Publishers Row. But I want you to know that that adds to the intrigue of the book, and that's why you're getting so many orders on the Internet. Now, my question is this. What can a liberal gleam from the book, other than the fact that free speech is in jeopardy, there's a Bolshevik in office, and the only, the only alternative in voting was for a schmuck with a nut job over energy? What can a liberal gleam from the book? <laughs> You're my kind of guy. At least you talk real. Uh, well, you can get a lot from the book. First of all, you can come to understand that most progressives are not liberals. Intolerance is not a liberal value. Intolerance is a value of the progressives who have hijacked liberalism. That's number one. And that is why the progressives in England ban my book. It's a warning in a way. It's a kind of, it's a kind of book that a liberal should buy. In fact, liberals should buy the book to say, look what happens when liberalism is hijacked. You know, like Islam, we, we, we know has been hijacked, let's say, by the Taliban, by radical Islamists, right? And they take a religion, they say, in the name of religion, I hear that I declare you must follow my way or I'll kill you or cut your head off. It's the same with progressives hijacking liberalism. They steal liberalism and they say in the name of liberalism, you must think this way, you must think that way, you must say this, you must not say that. That is why my book was banned in Britain. You know what's going to be interesting, Brian, as a a true liberal, is this. I'm going to ask you a question because you seem to know what you're talking about. What if I get orders from England for this book? Will my book be banned in England? That's going to be interesting if that happens, wouldn't it? That would be very interesting. I'm sure you're going to. If I was in Britain and I listened and I had been a listener of your show, maybe in the States or in Britain prior to you being banned, I'd be furious right now. And now, you live in Santa Fe, which is like outside of Marin County, Austin, Texas. Everyone's a super lib, right? Yep, super. Super lib. And they all believe in global warming? They'll believe in global warming, the energy crisis. They believe in a lot of nonsense. Do they, they, they worship Gaia? I mean, I don't know, but they all have these friggin' license plates that say Obaminos. It makes me sick. No, oh, so they've been obotomized. They've all had an obotomy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Brian, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I haven't done it yet. I'm giving you a free copy of Psychological Nudity. In fact, because you're a liberal who wants to reach out across the aisle, I'm going to reserve a copy for free for Brian. Take his name, guys, and send it to my fulfillment house in Florida. One free copy of... A psycho- it's not psychological. <laughs> Abandoned Britain, I'm sorry. He gets banned in Britain when it's published. That's the next case. Sherry in New York on WOR. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Savage Nation. Dr. Savage, I'm calling in tonight because you had said something earlier that uh, really struck a chord with me. You mentioned about telling your stories and that people were probably hanging up by now and tuning out. And I wanted you to know that we're not hanging up and tuning out. We're turning the volume up on the radio so that we can hear you even more clearly. 
Last uh, Thanksgiving, two days before Thanksgiving, I had an intentionally negligent landlord burn down my home. He murdered both of my dogs. I had one dog that was 16, and I had an eight-month-old beagle puppy. I knew logically that I should sue him, and I had legal ground. But when it came time to walk into that courtroom to face that monster, I had to gain strength somewhere. So I looked up to God, and I said, what would my father do? And then I smiled, and I said, what would Dr. Savage do? And I opened me. I would. Me. I don't want to tell you what I would have done because I'd be arrested for saying it. Well, you have no idea what it took to open that courtroom door and to walk in there and to face that monster and to tell him you're not going. Oh, oh, you did. You did go in there. Oh yes, sir. I did. I looked up to God and I said, "What would my father do?" All right, so you went in and you faced him. I hope the SOB got what he deserved. Well, I got a sizable settlement, and now we're going to the Attorney General in New Jersey, and we're hoping to have his license taken so that he'll never do this to anybody else again. What, what, what do you mean his license? He's a landlord with a license for what? A plumber. He was storing his explosive plumbing equipment right up against the place I lived in. My attorney sent a letter what is out. This guy, before I get de de into this case in any detail, because I wouldn't know if it's something I can comment on, are you saying this has been proven that's why your house burned down? Did he intentionally burn your house down? He was storing explosives up against my bedroom wall. And when we went to court, the jury, the uh, insurance company decided that they were going to give me an award rather than even bothering to take it to a jury because they'd get creamed. Okay, so in other words, there was clear negligence on the part of the landlord in the way he was storing the plumbing supplies. But he didn't intentionally burn your house down. Well, that's debatable. The New Jersey uh, State Police are... But, Sherry, why would he have burnt your house down? Why would he burn your house down? For what? Because, unfortunately, there are people that don't care about anything on earth other than their own needs. And when he was told by my attorney to get that stuff out, he looked at okay, us... Okay, so you had told him to get the stuff out of the, off the property. Yes. That's All right, well, now we're bordering on, like, a bad uh, uh, legal show. But I, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you. For the call, because there is a couple, there are a few legal shows around lawyers trying to shyster a few uh, clients. You know, I'm not into that. So, what do you need a lawyer for, huh? You're calling for a lawyer, huh? I love those shows. You don't really need a lawyer. What are you calling for a lawyer for? What do you need a lawyer for? Just go to Don Corleone. Settle it the old way. I'll be right back. If you want so here we are, here we are in the midst of a whole changing tide in the United States of America. And uh, we know what the score is. You know, in other words, where I stand on everything. So why should I repeat it every day till I get my blood pressure through the ceiling? You know where I stand. So I'd rather I say, if you can't improve upon the uh, silence of the desert, it's po pointless to talk. So you can call me with questions and I'll give you the answers. That's all. New York, W-O-R, George, you're up on the Savage Nation. Topic, please. Uh, Dr. Savage, I spoke to you once before about growing up in the city. Remember opening up fire hydrants? Yes. Okay, uh, I got your book. Thank you. It's wonderful. And there was a segment in there about the Wax Museum in Coney Island. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was frightening. My grandfather and uncle dragged me there. I was about seven or eight years old, and we went in there, and I was tolerating the, the statues of uh, Hitler and Stalin and all the rest. And then we came into the murder room, the murder row, and there was a, uh, a graphic depiction of a man skinning a child in a bathtub. And that trauma. The one that sticks with me to this day was a guy who uh, they found hiding in a chicken coop in New Jersey who had, uh, with dismembered body parts under his bed. To this day, I have nightmares about it. That's in psychological nudity, right, George? Yes, sir. Terrible. I don't even want to think about it. I'm sorry. I can't. I'm sorry, George. I gotta. I gotta go. Because right now, my honor has been dismembered by the British government, and I'm trying to put the uh, body politic back to back together, which is why I wrote, uh, uh, you know, Band in Britain. And I do hope you'll understand how important it is for liberals, conservatives, and libertarians to have this book. This is a book about free speech. That's why you should buy it. Now let's go to the callers. Monterey, California. Jason, welcome to the Savage Nation. Hi, Mike. It's truly my honor to speak with you. Um, hey, I got a quick question. That, you know, it goes along your lipoprotein A numbers. Congratulations, by the way. But uh, thanks. When I was stationed in uh, Baltimore, or near Baltimore, there was a great place I used to get some good carbonara, and now we're here, and I can't find any um, any really, really good. Carbonara. Are you talking about spaghetti alla carbonara? Here's the thing: I don't eat that food because it's too rich in butter, cheese, uh, and prosciutto. And egg yolks for me. I mean, it's just too rich for my diet. So that, a lot of people like creamy sauces. I don't eat them. 
I, I understand how you have to make them. I mean, you have to make it with butter and prosciutto and egg yolks and heavy cream and and, and parmigiano reggiano. But I can't eat that kind of food. It's just way off the scales for me. If you're young and you like it, God bless you. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, I know what you mean, Mike. But thank you. That's I didn't say don't eat it if you're young. When you're young, you can eat anything. That's what youth is for. So I don't I don't eat that type of food. Now, if you're talking about other kinds of foods, uh, like shrimp marinara, I love shrimp marinara. That's like one of my favorite dishes. I like meatballs. But I don't want to get into recipes now. I mean, we could do that. Still hard to find a good meatball. L don't call with meatball, please. I happen to have wonderful Italian parsley in my backyard. Unbelievable. Good Italian parsley when you grow it yourself. Nothing's like when you grow it yourself. But you know, now my whole life's changing again. I told you I went off all dairy about three months ago, which probably explains in part why some of the numbers changed. <clears throat> my triglycerides did come down slightly, even though they're elevated. And I've been taking a lot of fish oil, so that probably helped triglycerides. But now I have another challenge. I, um, I have to go off all of the Solanaceae. I've known about this for 30 years, but I wouldn't admit that I knew it. But I do have to get off tomatoes, which I love and I grow. Everything I love now I have to drink. Tomatoes, no. Eggplant, no. I mean, I'm talking about eggplant now. No tomatoes, no eggplant, no potatoes, and no red pep, no red bell pepper. And I eat them all the time. Why? Because they're solanaceae. They are members of the nightshade family. All of them are related to slightly uh, arthritic reactions in sensitive individuals. It just shows you. you know, I had a great friend in the medical business, Dr. Robert Cathcote, who passed away this year. Or la yeah, this year, I think. I loved, I loved him very much. He was a very brilliant man, one of the finest men I ever met in my life. But he said something to me. He worked very closely with Linus, Paul, Linus Pauling. He actually was a clinician who treated over 50,000 people with mega doses of vitamin C. He knew, knew more about it than anybody on earth. But Bob told me that we are addicted specifically to that that we are attracted. That we're addicted to that which is bad for us. Let's put it to you that way, meaning in foods. Everything that is bad for us, we're addicted to in foods. And you know what turns out to be true? Like whatever you crave is no good for you. Everything you like is either illegal, immoral, or fattening. It's true. Savage. All right, you want me to do politics now? I'll give you politics. Do you think Obama will be a one-term president? Do you think that he can come back from the trillion-dollar so-called economic recovery plan and the almost 10,000 pork barrel chests that he distributed to all of the grifters around America. Do you think that the schmucks who voted for him uh, are finally onto the fact that he's a con man? I mean, the economic recovery plan, stimulus plan, cost a trillion dollars, nothing happened, and 9,000 individuals benefited from it. Okay? Are you aware of the fact that the English medical system is a disaster? Do you know that more than 30,000 people have died in England and Wales from hospital infections in just five years? Do you know that if that was translated proportionally into American demographics, that would be 150,000 fatalities from hospital infections alone if the British system, meaning the socialized health care system of Britain, was brought to America, the one that, uh, that Obama, the community organizer, wants, the man who wants a union of Soviet states of America. Now, there's a great article about all of this by one of my favorite columnists called Gerald Warner out of England, President Panty Waste and Retreat. And his article says, President Panty Waste and Retreat, Barack Obama hoists the white flag over Stalinist health care proposals. And I would recommend that you read it on michaelsavage.com. He says, Obama's plan for socialized health care on the Stalinist model across the United States is now in full retreat. Not only will it not play in Peoria, it will not play anywhere. I'm not so sure. I personally believe... Uh, as Don Fetter writes, uh, another great columnist, by the way, that the white flag that Obama and his Stalinist minions are flying right now is meant to discharge the opposition. That is the American voter. And the minute the American voter stops uh, reacting, they're going to take down the white flag and they're going to go full steam ahead on the Stalinist model uh, of socialized health care that they plan. These are very, very uh, dangerous politicians. And I believe that you've got to keep your eye on these people. After all, Kathleen Sebelius, that nice-looking HHS secretary, is a very deceptive woman. She, remember, was the head of the Kansas, uh, uh, one of the um, law, law groups over there, the head of the Kansas Law Society or whatever, for eight years. Kansas Trial Lawyers Association. She's a trial lawyer. She has now wormed her way into being the head of HHS, which is where there's no, why there's no discussion 
about stopping tort suits, lawsuits, uh, medical lawsuits. You know, I turn on the news like everyone, cable. Every other ad now is for some shyster law firm. Did you take this drug and does your joint hurt? Did you take that medication and does your hand hurt? Call this shyster law firm and that shyster law firm. I start to shake that a country permits this to go on, that men like that are not, are not thrown in jail and their assets seized. They're worse than Bernie Madoff. You know what I'm saying? Bernie Madoff basically took, how should I put it, um, slightly gullible people who were a little greedy. I mean, I don't know how to put it. You know, not all of them are such victims. I've told you that. But when you go after a an American corporation, most of which do the best job they can in producing a decent product, and you yourself were a lawyer who never produced anything, doesn't provide a service, all you are is a criminal leech with a law degree, to me that's criminal activity. That's all. That's why I'd rather talk about... Uh, uh, about uh, recipes. San Diego, David, welcome to the Savage Nation. Thank you for having me, Dr. Savage. It's an honor. I wanted to talk to you about tomatoes. Um, I've been a martial artist for many years, and one of my instructors from Japan informed me many years ago that tomatoes had a natural anti-inflammatory compound in them. Now I'm confused, and I respect your opinion. I wanted to clarify that. Cause you it's said an interesting paradox, and I don't have the direct answer. I know that there's there's literature... That may not be that scientific on on uh, the Solanaceae or the tomato, the eggplant, the potato, and the red pepper. That shows that it, it provokes inflammatory reaction. I also know that when the tomato was first introduced to Europe in the I think the 1500s or the 1600s, it was considered a toxic uh, a fruit. I don't know if you know that. Originally, it was considered toxic. The tomato, the Italians wouldn't touch it. Originally, it's a strange thing. It's a staple of Italian food, obviously, with red sauces. But originally, the tomato was seen as a poisonous fruit, and they wouldn't touch it. Dr. Savage, could I uh, also interject that I was an executive chef for many years, and I would like to give you one of my salad dressing recipes. I've been listening to your show, and I kind of know your taste a little bit. And If you could take me off the air, I'd be honored to uh, give it to you. What you say? What, which recipe? It's a salad dressing recipe. It's based with olive oil, garlic, lemon juice, mustard. It's similar to Caesar. But it's no, I would love it. I would love it. You can say, you want to email it to me? The guys will give you their email address, uh, David. David, thank you uh, for calling. Stay on the line, David, and we'll get that recipe for salad dressing. That's all. What could be better? Eating well is the best revenge. Drinking well is the best revenge. So what would you like to talk about? Tomatoes, potatoes, potatoes, tomato, potatoes are cheaper, tomatoes are cheaper. And now's the time to grab a gal. You want me to sing? I mean, you want me to bore you with tomatoes Uncle singing? Oh, God. Oh, yes, that was during the Depression. They're trying to encourage people to get married and have children instead of going to a nightclub and uh, having sex with eight men and coming home like a disheveled prostitute in the morning. You know what's cool? Everything's upside down. How often do you see a woman with a baby carriage today, unless she's an illegal alien, trying to create an anchor baby? You think about it. When I was a kid, all the young women proudly pushed their children around, and, and other women would stop, and they would look at each other's child and support it. Motherhood was looked up like on a pedestal. Today, I have the word for it, but it's not motherhood that's put up on a pedestal. And I know who did this. You can trace it back to about one one to two people did it to America. They've destroyed the flower of American youth. First they went after the boys, now they've gone after the girls. The girls don't know what they're doing. The girls glorify partying. That's the sign of a, 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 a woman's life now, to get drunk in a nightclub and wind up with your legs upside down, with a dress over your face, with a stranger. That That's what a woman is supposed to, to, to role model on. The sluts that they put out on television, the degenerates who make the TV movies, don't get me started. I know who runs the television industry. I know all about the mafia that runs the TV industry. I had a few run-ins with them a while ago. I know all about the, uh, the agencies in Hollywood who control everything you hear on television, who control every image that goes into your child's head. Don't tell me who they are. They're all sick in the head, every last one of them. Why don't you rein them in? Because that would be censorship, would it? So you want to censor me, but you don't want to censor the degenerates of Sunset Boulevard? I should be censored for political speech because I believe in borders, language, and culture, but you don't want to censor the degenerates who put out this pollution and destroy your children, turn them into junkies and whores. That's what I would say to you if I knew you, but you don't know me and I don't know you, so I won't say it. In fact, I didn't even say it at all. Uh, the Hem may lose his TV show, speaking of TV. I think the Hem could be on the way back to Raid. No more star, uh, star screen and Raid. Radio, what was it? The star of radio, television, and stage. 
I think the hem is back to the mic soon. No more pancake. Something tells me the hem hit a stone wall. He ran into a... Well, let's wish him the best. I mean, he deserves the best, uh, the hem. one 800 449 Let's see. What do you want me to do? Read the secret emails? Disclose. It's an important book. I'm not going to hammer it too much because you're going to buy it anyway. I'm not hungry for the money. I'm hungry to see the truth get out. And after Labor Day, when uh, when everyone's back from the holiday, I'll start heavy again. I killed myself to get that up on the website by yesterday. I don't know. I was like rushing. Or banned in Britain. We're down now to the the manuscript needs to be read one more time. Then it goes to the copy editor. Oh God, I can't take it anymore. How many iterations of this book there have been? You can go blind from doing a book. This is an easier ways to make money than writing books. Let me tell you, particularly good books. Now, if you're the hemorrhoid, what you do is you take books that other people have written that you steal and you have a, a ghostwriter put paraphrases around Thomas Paine's writings and you call it your book. You know, you code it with a little preparation H and, and the American people think you... It's unbelievable to me what passes for a book today. They put their name on it and it's not a book. I write real books. I write Persian miniatures. Each of my books is a classic. I take pride in it. I'm actually a writer by training. And by inclination, because I'm a quiet person. I know you don't believe it. I really am a quiet person. I, I feel like taking a vow of silence. But I can't do it yet. I, that's why I started this show. That's, I know that there's an Arabic Arabic saying uh, that says, if you cannot improve upon the silence of the, of the desert, don't speak. I like that. Of course, that was a way of controlling uh, people. Fine. But it's actually very well put. Silence is golden in a way. But how do you go from this to, you know, from a thousand to zero? How do you take a man who's a test pilot, basically, and tell him to never fly again? I'm like a test pilot. Every day I get up and fly at supersonic uh, speeds and at supersonic al altitudes, 80,000 feet, 85,000 feet. I fly till the wings almost fall off the plane. In fact, sometimes they have fallen off the plane, and I've had a parachute out of some of the test craft. <laughs> I think I've bailed out five times now and survived. But how do you go from that life to zero? How is it possible? I don't know if I just fish. Just, I don't know. Maybe it's possible. I admire people who are taciturn. Don't get me wrong. I don't think everyone has to be hyperverbal to, to be intelligent. I learned that there are very intelligent people who don't speak very well or don't speak at all. I understand that as well. But I don't think you can just turn it off. It'd be like taking a silent person and saying, here's a microphone. Talk for three hours a day. Make sense. Be humorous. Be entertaining. Keep the show going. Keep 100 balls in the air and, and have people come back for more. Impossible. So the reverse is true, too. Now you can say meditation. I don't believe in meditation. Talk about things like that. I tried it. It's like, I remember the years that I tried to meditate. I sat on the floor and put my hands together with other people. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I almost went nuts from it. What do you mean meditation? How can you enforce meditation on people unless they're in a prison? Remember the age of feedback, biofeedback, that Hazarai, that... They made it up, biofeedback. <laughs> remember the biofeedback? I remember once I went to a doctor in the 80s for something. I don't know what it was. I already showed signs and was worried about it, but they said, try biofeedback. I didn't know what it was. I like, sat with like a, thing, a machine that had a slight hum with a wire, and I was supposed to stare at it. And I picked up a signal. I was supposed to send back the signal. Picked up the, you know what I decided to do? Watch more television because the alpha waves was something I could tune, in, tune into and send back waves to. You know what I mean? The alpha waves of television worked for me. I tried them. I couldn't do biofeedback. I can't do meditation. It's the same with yoga. I don't understand yoga. I'm not saying that there isn't anything to it. But it's, again, to each his own. It's not for me. Again, I can't sit on a floor with a leotard and bend over and twist my legs up and down. They're like modified sexual postures from the Kama Sutra to begin with. Let me give you my in intuition on it anyway. I'll tell you later another time. If this wasn't a family show, I'll tell you where yoga came from. You have to trace it back to the Kama Sutra and the positions in the Kama Sutra. Then you've got to understand that a lot of the people in those ancient days were manipulators, and the people were all serfs. And they, they basically told people what to do. They could come in, that I wouldn't go into the sexual thing, and, all right, we're going to meditate now. Bend over that way and put your leg over your head and you know, sit there and hum, and I'll be back in three hours. All right, I'm going to take a break now. It is the Savage Nation. We're talking about this and that, that and this, and the Savage Nation, from politics to, to recipes to... Lipoprotein, lipoprotein A, whatever you want to talk about on the Savage Nation. I mean, I think that's what makes talk radio fabulous. R uh, Richard in Florida, you're next up. Go ahead, please. 
Uh, yes, Dr. Savage. Uh, I haven't heard you really talk much about art, and I was curious uh, what movement in the 20th century uh, did you have a liking for? Or Okay, it's a good question. Now, I know when you say 20th century, there are limitations, but uh, I'd have to go back to the Impressionists, which, of course, may not meet that, uh, that time frame. Is that correct? Well, you're right, but I, I meant those two. They are late, more they were the late 19th century, but uh, I just wondered how you thought about the German Expressionists or the, you know, the foes. Well, look, everyone has their own tastes. I am still attached mostly to uh, the era of Gauguin. I still, if I go to a museum, I go immediately to the Impressionists. You could say I grew up on them. I mean, we didn't have any in my house, but I always gravitated to Gauguin as my favorite. In fact, when I was able, when I was older and collecting plants in the South Pacific, I made certain to visit some of the islands uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the chain in which he, in, he lived. He, oh, I mean, these are amazing places to go to. You have to go to the Marquesas, one of the uh, most uh, uh, obscure islands on Earth, to see where he painted and the people actually looked like he made them in his paintings with those very, very dramatically angular faces, the, the land of the man, the land of man. I, I'm still nuts about almost everything Picasso has ever done. I wouldn't declare that Manet was an Impressionist, but Manet's painting, Bar at the Follies Berger, 1881, who can ever forget that one of the bar girl with the dower, with the kind of sad face, with the beautiful outfit looking out from behind the bar? You know the one I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, how can anyone ever forget that painting? And they, they don't even know who painted it. But Monet would be more the Impressionist than Manet, obviously. And Monet, I mean, how many times can you look at a water lily? Apparently, he couldn't get enough of them. What I'm most impressed uh, about Monet was the fact that in his later years, he was crippled, I believe, with arthritis. And he had his assistant attach the paintbrush to his hand with a, with a rope or a string, rather. And he continued to paint till almost the day he died. That was an amazing story, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, sir. So that doesn't really answer your it doesn't really answer your question, nor am I technically uh, c c able to give you technical statements about any of these things. It's all a matter of personal taste and what you know what strikes you. So of the, of those people mentioned, which would you say is your favorite? Uh, I I would say of those people mentioned, I guess Gauguin. The po he was a post impressionist. He and Van Gogh, but uh, I guess Gauguin. Yeah, I would. Say. It's unbelievable. I mean, but I studied almost every biography ever written about that man because he fascinated me in that he was a stockbroker in Paris, left the family, moved to Tahiti, tried to paint, sent the paintings back, none of them sold, and then he retreated to even uh, further reaches of the uh, French Polynesian area. And wherever he went, he got into trouble. If there was one official on the island, which there was, he wound up in a lawsuit with that one official. He hated authority. Yeah, I can really relate to, uh, <laughs> to to Gauguin. I remember he moved, I think it was uh, Hiva Oa. There was one French official on that island, and he locked horns with that official over something. And uh, they wound up in, in terrible straits with each other. He hated any authority whatsoever. I think his painting reflects that, don't you think? Yes, I think he was a scoundrel of sorts. He was a scoundrel. I like that scoundrel part of him. <laughs> no, you have to admire that kind of scoundrel. I mean, he didn't shoot anybody. Now, he did. He did. He did die of yours. I don't know if you know that. Did you know that? Is that syphilis? Well, it is related to syphilis, and it was a result of his uh, screwing around with a lot of young girls in the Tahiti Islands, and I'm talking about underage girls. He was known for that. Uh, it was not considered a moral uh, crime in those days in those parts of the world, but certainly everybody understands he wasn't doing the young girls a favor. In fact, the one thing to say to a young girl is, "Don't waste uh, uh, your your young years on old. On, 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 don't don't waste your youth on old age." But they didn't understand it; they were poor, and he took advantage of them. Sure. But I don't think that diminishes from his art. You know, I, I still must tell you that Van Gogh still wipes me away. If I get next to a painting of Van Gogh's, it changes my my mind chemistry. I'll never forget as long as I live. I went into a museum in San Francisco when they once had a great Van Gogh collection and they had them without glass on front of them. And there's one painting that he painted toward the end of his life when he was totally crazy, when he was losing his mind completely, and the thickness of the oil and the swirls, if you look very close at his face, if he got within an inch of his painting, which I did, they let you get that close, that's before the psycho started coming into museums and, and slashing paintings. You had to get real close to that, that, that Van Gogh portrait, self-portrait. <clears throat> the painting were, it was in swirls of his own face. 
And when you looked right at it, you, you no longer saw a face. What you saw was swirls of color going in circles, which probably mimicked what was going on inside his head in a way that nobody can understand unless you're crazy, because there's a certain joy in being mad that only mad men know, as one uh, a, a writer wrote. The phone number here, I don't even want to give you anymore. I just want the man ask me a question. I gave him an answer. And I hope that the answer was of some interest to some of you out there. And I hope it stimulates interest in real art again, because, again, with the Internet, I think people have lost the idea that you even have to go next to a painting to see the painting. Press a button, click, click, there's Monet, there's Monet, there's Gauguin, and you think you see it. Well, you do. You see it in two dimension. But paintings were really painted for the third dimension. And they have to be looked at from a certain distance, meaning the, the right perspective. There's a very famous story of Gauguin's Green Horse, which I, until recently, I think, I think it still does, it has an entire room devoted to it. One painting, an entire room at the Louvre in Paris. A whole room, the Green Horse. And... He painted it. He couldn't sell any of his paintings. So a local pharmacist liked him, and he commissioned a painting of his horse in his pasture. So Gauguin works on this uh, painting for months. He comes over to the pharmacist's house. He unveils the painting. The pharmacist says, let me see the painting. He unveils it, and he says, but that's not my horse. You made the horse green. And Gauguin says to the pharmacist who commissioned the painting, but sir, but sir, at the end of the day, when you're reclining on your balcony and you've had some drinks and things are hazy and the sun is setting, doesn't the horse look green? Savage. You are listening to Michael Savage Archives on Really Big Something Channel. Well, here's what we've been talking about in part today. I asked you, have you met someone recently who seemed as they've been obotomized? In going through your day-to-day -day life, have you met someone who acted as if they had been completely brainwashed by the leftist lies of Obama? Someone who seemed as if they had undergone an obotomy? Where did you meet them? What was your experience with the obotomized? Now, if you've met someone like this, what are the primary characteristics of someone who's been obotomized? How do you respond to them? Or are you able to suggest an appropriate method of treating an obotomy? Where do those who have had an obotomy tend to congregate? At bookstores, coffee shops, hybrid car dealerships, socialized radio? Are we going to have socialized radio? Because let me tell you, they're coming at us every which way to uh, Moscow. I've told you on the show before that although the so-called fairness doctrine may be dormant, the neo-Marxists in the White House and the Congress are now concocting new and nefarious methods of trying to destroy conservative talk radio. The latest is the appointment of Mark Lloyd, the FCC's new diversity director. You see, Lloyd authored a paper for the far left of Center, Center for American Progress, entitled, quote, The Structural Imbalance of Political Talk Radio. And here's what this genius wrote. Any effort to encourage more responsive and balanced radio programming will first require steps to increase localism and diversify radio station ownership to better meet local and community needs. In other words, Radio Free Zimbabwe. In other words, the government will impose affirmative action on radio station ownership. But it doesn't end there. The genius Lloyd continues, quote, We suggest three ways to accomplish this. Restore local and national caps on the ownership of commercial radio stations. Ensure greater local accountability over radio licensing. It require commercial owners who fail to abide by enforceable public interest obligations to pay a fee to support PBS. So this clown wants to forbid successful station owners from becoming successful. And if they don't play leftist shows on their stations, then he'll force them to support radical left-wing programming on NPR. It's pure communism. Last week, Senator Charles Grassley sent a letter to the FCC voicing his concerns about this clown Lloyd's plans to destroy Michael Savage's conservative talk radio show. Grassley said, quote, Taken together, these statements represent a view that the FCC needs to expand its regulatory arm further into the commercial radio market. You see, it's an attempt by Obama to socialize radio and the media in the same way he's trying to socialize health care. Now, by standing up and making enough noise, conservatives have made the White House retreat on socialized medicine. And if we do the same thing with the attempts to make it government radio, Obama will have no choice but to stop this and fire this dummy. Government radio, GR, that's what you're going to get under the Obama minions. 
Now socialized testing has failed. Well, the results of the standardized school tests in California have come out. And in spite of the billions and billions of dollars poured into racist programs to try to give minorities the advantage over whites, the results are pretty much the same. Asians and whites do about 30% better than blacks and Hispanics. This is actually the fault of liberals who have focused a generation of children on race rather than success. They've poisoned the minds of children with the injuries of the past rather than the opportunities of the present. And so an entire generation lives in the past and an entire generation believes they cannot succeed because they've been taught that the white man is keeping them down. Well, it doesn't seem to work that way with Asians. After all, they're not Caucasian. How come Asians do so well if the white man is so bad? It has nothing to do with race, okay? Shame on you leftist teachers of California. The youth you teach will never succeed until you stop filling their minds with hatred and racism. You heard me talk about Obama's socialist policies. I'm not the only one joining us today to help point out these warning signs of this administration's communist leanings is Wayne Allen Root. Thanks, Michael. Have you read the headlines this past week? Obama has proposed trillions of dollars in new taxes, trillions of dollars of irresponsible, unsustainable new spending, with no way to pay for it all except to literally wipe out small businessmen and women and wipe out the upper middle class of America to enslave our children and grandchildren with a mountain of debt and heavy taxes for a lifetime. It is plainly and simply the very definition of socialism. Let's say it out loud. Obama is a socialist. There isn't any need to debate anymore. No point in even arguing. If liberals and biased liberal media won't face facts, I'm going to put the facts right in their face. Up close and personal, Jeff Foxworthy style. You see, Jeff Foxworthy literally defined rednecks. He didn't leave any doubt. All you could do was laugh and say, Jeff, hit that one right on the nose. Well, I'm going to now define a socialist. And when I'm done, you can only cry and say, wow, Wayne sure described that Obama fellow. Exactly. If you want government to take over business, banks, car makers, Wall Street, hijack the entire economy, you might be a socialist. If you think it's fine and dandy for government to decide CEO salaries, to hire and fire CEOs, to pick board of directors of private companies, you might be a socialist. If you think 32 czars appointed by Obama can run the American economy by committee, even though few of any have ever run a business. And if you think it's okay to appoint a car czar who admits publicly he knows nothing about cars, you might be a socialist. If you want to give away as much as $100 million of taxpayer money to GM and Chrysler just so that they can go bankrupt anyway, but then hand the company to the unions that bankrupted them in the first place, you might be a socialist. If you want to pass cap and trade and convert America to a green economy to create millions of jobs, even though Spain is the greenest economy in all of Europe, and they have 18% unemployment, the highest in all of socialist Europe, you might be a socialist. If you support universal health care, even though a majority of Americans are happy with their present health plan, and government is the one that has screwed up health care in the first place with overregulation, even though government has run the U.S. Postal Service into bankruptcy, and run Amtrak into bankruptcy, and the public school system is in shambles and loses tens of billions per year, and Medicare and Medicaid threaten to bankrupt the entire economy with their gigantic losses, all run by government, and government has run up $5.3 trillion in unfunded liability just for pensions and free health care for government employees, and you think government is the answer to cutting the cost of health care, you might be a socialist. If you think government can save money on health care, even though the exact same people that run government have brought you an almost $2 trillion deficit and almost $100 trillion in debt, almost double the world GDP, all the money made in the world each year, that's our debt. And despite the fact that government loses money at every department and every agency at every level every year since inception, you might be a socialist. And you're definitely an idiot. <laughs> if you propose paying for universal health care with taxes on the health benefits of every employee in America except union employees, you might be a socialist. If you propose paying for health care by punishing the rich with a 5% surcharge on their incomes, even though... That same group you are punishing, small business owners, already pays virtually all the taxes 
and creates all the jobs in America, you might be a socialist. If you support a VAT tax, just like socialist Europe, that puts a deadly tax on every product in America, at every level of production and purchase, on top of all our other state, federal, and local taxes, you might be a socialist. If you are in favor of bailouts of certain companies and certain industries who just happen to give you large campaign contributions, all with taxpayer money, and you don't even think to ask the permission of taxpayers, and you don't or won't disclose who got the money or how much, and you don't even say please or thank you, even though it's our money paying for it all in the first place, and you never even bother to read the thousand-plus page bailout bills delivered to you only hours before you voted yes, you might be a socialist. If you call it a tax cut when you give a welfare check to people that never pay taxes in the first place, you might be a socialist. If you think all your friends deserve a government job for life and obscene salaries far higher than the private sector and bloated pensions for life and health care for life and a guaranteed job for life, you may be a socialist. And by the way, if after all that, you're a Columbia University economics professor and you ever gave a student named Barack Obama an A, you might be a socialist. And if you think it's perfectly fine to appoint a Supreme Court justice for life who thinks that a Latina woman can make a better decision from the bench than a white male simply because of the color of her skin, you might be a racist. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's safe to say our country, our economy, our education system, and capitalism itself is being run and ruined by socialists, racists, and idiots. It's time to stand up. It's time to fight. It's time to put manners and politeness aside. It's time to offend. It's time to yell, scream, protest, and get angry. It's time to take back our country before there is no country or economy left to take back. God bless America. Thanks, Wayne. This is the Savage Nation. I'll be back. I didn't know Robert Novak. I hope he went to... uh the place where we all hope to go and not to the other place where liberals go. But he's getting a lot of play. We can't say anything bad about the dead unless they lived in San Francisco. And You know, all right, so it brings up your mortality. What are they going to say about you when you die and this and that? And lo and behold, lo and behold, my cardiologist sent me my lab results. I'm supposed to see him tomorrow. Then I don't have any cardiac trouble, but I go once a year because I got upside-down lipids. You can say, what, are you crazy talking about your blood lipids on the air? Yes, because I'm going to lead to a medical point that may be of some value to some of you out there who are a little concerned uh, about your uh, cholesterol, for example. And so many Americans are being sold on Lipitor and Lipitor-like drugs who may not need them. And I want to talk about that for a minute because there are other things that you might be able to do that are not drug-related, but the society is drugged to death whether they're on antidepressants when they don't need them, or they're on anti-cholesterol medications when they may not need them. The country is drugged to death. And what's interesting is it ties right into the health care debate because you'll notice that the drug companies are all in favor of Obamacare. Now, why would the drug companies be in favor of Obamacare? Because it will give unlimited prescription drugs to everybody in America, and they'll make trillions of dollars. You understand how this works? You understand how this all works together? Follow the money. So let's go back to the fact that, oh yeah, drugs are lifesavers, don't get me wrong. But they should be used as a last resort, not on a recreational basis, as is being done in this country. Many of the American people today are practicing recreational medicine. Everybody in this country thinks something's wrong with them and gets a prescription for it. Now in some cases, I said, RXs can save your life, but in most cases, they're useless or dangerous, okay? Now having laid the groundwork for that, I want to go back again to what I'm talking about. For years, I've struggled with upside-down uh, VAP uh, profiles, my LDL high, my HDL low, my overall cholesterol through the ceiling, triglycerides high. Whatever you look at, it's upside-down. So if a normal person got this, they would run and say, I, I do anything because I think I'm going to die. But it's been like this for 20 years. But I'm not dead. And thus far, I haven't had a heart attack, so it doesn't make sense. Unless you get an even more refined test, which I got. Now, remember, I come from a family of early death by coronary heart disease. I don't want to give you the ages and turn it into a joke. But I've been running scared about a heart attack since I'm 30, maybe 20, which is what drove me into the jungles of the South Seas, collecting plants, drove me to get a Ph.D. in epidemiology and nutrition, drove me to research and write books on health before I went into radio, 
And I'll never forget, when I entered radio in 1994, I said, this is probably going to kill me younger than I normally would go, but it'll be worth it. And, you know, every day is a miracle to me, but I'm still here 15 years later, and the stress level's as high as it could be. You have to say, well, how the hell does a guy live like this with this kind of stress? People have said to me, I blow off steam on the air, so therefore I'm alive. All right, that's one way to look at it. It's probably folklorically true. What I'm saying is I have a zero LPA. Last time it was very low, like a zero one. Now it's a zero. It's because I've been dosing myself to, 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 to life with fish oils and a few other things. What I'm getting at is I have no control, by and large, over the LPA other than taking lots of vitamin, vitamin C. But it's genetic. So I must have inherited from my mother her LPA levels. She died at 88. My dad, may rest in peace, died at 57. I'm hoping that my LPA is inherited. Uh, it was inherited from my mother, but I definitely got it from someone. On to other topics. I grew up with a dog. I was very lucky. Even when I was a kid, I had a dog. I've had a dog all my life. Always had a dog. And, uh, well, I wrote about Tippy and all in, in psychological nudity. He was the part chow. Lunatic dog. Ripped my foot open when I was 11. And now I have the smartest dog I've ever had in my life, which is a small 10-pound dog. Uh, they call it a toy poodle. I don't like the word toy when it comes to an animal. There's nothing about a toy about him. It's like a condensed poodle. You say poodle, you think foo-foo, weak. You know, a real standard poodle is not a weak dog. They're phenomenal watchdogs. And a, uh, a small one, well, let me put it to you this way. Uh, would you like to be bitten by a gopher? Would you like to be bitten by a rat? Would you like to be bitten by any animal with sharp incisor teeth? No. So why would you think that a 10-pound animal with sharp teeth, is a weakling. You know, don't underestimate any dog. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. If you've ever been bitten by a dog of any size, it's going to be quite quite an awesome experience. But Teddy is not a watchdog, okay? He's not an attack dog. He's just a, a companion. Great ears, great sense of smell. Sometimes I hold him in my arms. I love to hold him in my arms on a, let's say I'm out on a, a walk somewhere. And I see somebody in the distance. Now, because I'm a man, I'm taller than him. I hold him in my arms where I put his head up at my level and I say to him, what do you smell over there, Teddy? What do you hear over there, Teddy? And I love to watch that nose go to work, to watch the sensor call the nose and see the olfactory organs. You know, you see and they start to inhale molecules out of the air or you could see the ears. I love to watch dogs' uh, actions. Anyway, I've always been a, a dog uh, lover I, in that regard. I remember one of the first books I ever got on dogs was called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Other Animals by Charles Darwin. I know that won't go over very big with uh, a, a, a creationist, but it has nothing to do with creationism. It has to do with observationism. And uh, Darwin was a heck of an observer, ir irrespective of whether you believe in evolution or not. It, it doesn't matter. He was one of the finest observers in history. Uh, in terms of his uh, capacity to understand comparative anatomy. But when he wrote the expression of, I wonder where that book is, I'll never forget it, because he showed pictures of man and his various expressions, Darwin did, and in the same book he showed dogs' expressions and their various uh, meanings. Keen observer. Savage. I want you to listen to some of what Obama had to say the other day about Afghanistan. You know the war that all the leftists support because o Obama is for it? Listen to him agonize about Afghanistan. As I've said before, that is the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning. It's the last thing that I think about when I go to sleep at night. And I will not hesitate to use force to protect the American people or our vital interests. It's eerie how much this speech sounds like the lead-up to Vietnam in the 60s. Obama may as well be LBJ saying these words about going into Vietnam. The insurgency in Afghanistan didn't just happen overnight, and we won't defeat it overnight. This will not be quick, nor easy. But we must never forget, this is not a war of choice. This is a war of necessity. Those who attacked America on 9-11 are plotting to do so again. If left unchecked, the Taliban insurgency will mean an even larger safe haven from which Al-Qaeda would plot to kill more Americans. So this is not only a war worth fighting, this is fundamental to the defense of our people. Fundamental to the defense of our people? What are we defending against? What are we fighting for? Why are we there? To help the Afghanis? That's what he seems to be saying here? Going forward, we will constantly adapt to new tactics, 
to stay ahead of the enemy and give our troops the tools and equipment they need to succeed. And at every step of the way, we will assess our efforts to defeat al-Qaeda and its extremist allies and to help the Afghan and Pakistani people build the future that they seek. Why do we need to help them seek a better future at the expense of American lives? His hypocrisy on this is terrible. What's even worse is the hypocrisy of the anti-war left, which has disappeared. Although the mainstream media ignores my battle to get my name off the banned list in Britain, I do have some supporters who do speak out regularly. One of them is Professor Ellis Washington, joins us now to talk about a second part to the article that he wrote, Savage, Silence of the Lambs, which can be found on michaelsavage.com and World Net Daily. Professor Washington, welcome back to the Savage Nation. Please give us some background on this second part of the article. What was your thought process? Well, Michael, as I said earlier, I always want to keep up with what's going on with you, with your blacklisting in Britain, and we all in the Savage Nation are waiting with bated breath to the day that your name is finally vindicated and you're removed from that list. In the meantime, I want to do all I can as a journalist, as a commentator for World Net Daily to trumpet your cause as new information comes out. And so with this latest information that's been going on with your lawyers in, in Britain and in America getting discovery and key documents that reach all the way to the highest levels of Prime Minister Gordon Brown's administration in England, I wanted to just update the Savage Nation audience and those out there with some of the latest information. You made reference to an article by Robert Conquest entitled Inside Stalin's Dark Room, which shows the power of these groups. Indeed, Michael. King Solomon, the great king and prophet of the uh, Old Testament, once said, I believe it was in the book of Ecclesiastes, that there is nothing new under the sun. So when I saw these terrible Stalinist tactics, these terrible enemies lists and blacklisting tactics launched without provocation against you, uh, Mr. Savage, I was very ticked off and angry, as you were, sir. And so I wanted to try to draw some of those analogies in history, Michael. And so I came across an interesting article by a Hoover Institution fellow, a gentleman named Robert Conquest. And I even posted some pictures that he wrote in this article called Inside Stalin's Dark. And any of the any of the Savage Nation audience can go to this article and you'll see the original picture that shows uh, Stalin along with Molotov and uh, his defense commissar, Borishalov. And there's also a picture of the chief of his secret police, a, a gentleman named Nikolai Yeskov. And the picture on the left shows Yeskov right next to Stalin, and they're walking along the Volga River. And then the next picture, he's gone. And you're like, well, this is the same, obviously the same picture. What happened to Stalin's uh, chief of police? Well, as we all know from history, Stalin was, uh, among other things, he was megalomaniac, and he, he was very you know, paranoid about people trying to do him in and things like that. And so the Zhezkov guy got on Stalin's bad side, obviously, and in 1939, Stalin had him disappeared. Now, this goes beyond just removing him from pictures. It goes to something even more deeper, more sinister, Michael, into removing the name of this man from all recorded history. And I was like, this is amazing. This is exactly what they're trying to do with you, Michael. They're trying to make you disappear, just like Stalin and his goons in Russia did back, you know, 70, 80 years ago. If the mainstream media had its way, I'm sure they'd make me disappear from the airwaves just as quickly as they could. But unbelievably, one of the more liberal magazines, the New Yorker, did what I think is an outstanding article on myself and the situation I find myself in. What did you think of that article? It's so ironic that of all the media entities in America, of which there are numerous, and there are numerous conservative entities, the Weekly Standard and the, the New Republic come to mind. None of these conservative stalwart institutions have come to your aid. You had to get front-page, first-rate article done by the New Yorker, which is a stalwart liberal media entity. And I want to give particular kudos to the young man that wrote the article for the New Yorker, Khalifa 
Sane, I believe is his name. He did an outstanding job. He was fair. He was balanced. He was not unduly fawning. He asked probing questions. And one of the things I particularly liked about Mr. Sane's uh, review of you, Michael, in The New Yorker, was he kind of delved into the psychological aspect of what makes Michael Savage the man tick. What motivates Michael Savage as an American citizen, as an American patriot, as a conservative intellectual? Winston Churchill endured much of the same thing in his effort to save Western civilization from the Nazis when he was banned by the BBC for over six years. Glenn Owen wrote an article about this. What are your thoughts? I wanted to, in addition to Khalifa's excellent article on you in the New Yorker, I wanted to bring the Savage Nation audience and those that are interested in the uh, the blacklisting that's being done against you by Britain, I wanted to bring their attention to Glenn Owen's excellent article that was published in the Daily Mail. Like you said, it was a, f a few weeks after Khalifa's article. And several things that Mr. Owen said in his article were very chilling. One of them was he was uh, talking about some of the, the emails that came out of the Gordon Brown administration one particularly said, it was on November 27th, and it said, with Weiner, in parentheses, Savage, I can understand that disclosure of the decision will help provide balance types of exclusion cases. And another uh, email that was marked restricted, it said, quote, we will want to ensure that the names of disclosed reflect the broad range of cases and are not all Islamic extremists. And another one from the uh, Home Office said that they wanted to include Weiner in their quarterly stats uh, and also as part of the, the, the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister are firmly behind naming such people. So we can see, Michael, that this blacklisting and this Alfred Dreyfus-like slandering and libeling of your name went to the highest levels of the Gordon Brown administration. It's unconscionable, Michael. In conclusion, where do you think this is going to go and what will be the outcome? Well, Michael, while I'm sorry that this happened to you, if this had happened to just a regular Joe Blow like myself or just an average American who didn't have the resources that you have to hire lawyers in America, in Great Britain, you have a top-flight legal staff working around the clock to vindicate your name, this would have just been forget. It never would have brought been brought to the attention of the British and the American public. But thank God, Michael, and I know it's been a terrible burden against you and your family, but thank God that you are willing to fight against this, that you just didn't lie down and roll over. And in my heart, my sincere belief, Michael, is that one day your name will be vindicated. The British government, whether they want to or not, will have to acknowledge the terrible injustice and the, and the tragedy that's been brought against your name, and they're going to have to give you a formal apology. And also, I think, as further discovery is being brought to bear, that you'll be able to see unmistakably that there's a connection between the British government and the Obama administration. We're already starting to see uh, evidences of that, but I think as time goes on, Michael, you're going to see that there's key people in the Obama administration that was directly in collusion with the British administration and that you're going to see that they were in collusion against you. And all that's going to come to light, Michael, very soon. Professor Washington, thank you again for another great piece and for being on The Savage Nation. Once again, Michael, I want to thank you and The Savage Nation for bringing me on to this wonderful show. You are in the vanguard, Michael. You're on the front lines in the battle for freedom of speech and freedom of expression for all Americans and for all those in England. And one day, Michael, I believe that your name is going to be vindicated, and I can't wait for that day to come. Thank you, Michael. This is the Savage Nation. Be here or be nowhere. Here's what's on michaelsavage.com. First of all, you're not going to believe this. But San Fran Psycho wants to shield illegal alien criminals from the feds. This jerk, a so-called supervisor, would pass a law which would make it more difficult for officials to hand over illegal youths suspected of crimes such as murder and drug dealing. I wonder which side he's on. Can you figure that one out who put him in office? I think I can. Doesn't anybody in San Francisco represent the real people instead of the criminals and the leeches? Can you name one supervisor who does represent the people 
rather than the criminals and the leeches? I can't. Now, don't miss Banned in Britain. First printing, first edition. Michael Savage's new book. Read the secret emails disclosing how the British government colluded to destroy a man's name and reputation. It is selling like hotcakes. Click on michaelsavage.com to get your copy. FCC Diversity Chief is going to regulate talk radio. Oh, my God. Take a look at this doll. A Canadian health official says that his health care system is sick. The incoming president of the CMA, the Canadian Medical Association, said that Canadians' health care system is sick and imploding. Go tell that to Obama. Don't miss Wes Pruden's article about Obama entitled, Finding No Buyers for Snake Oil. Here's a nice one for you. 90% of U.S. currency is tainted with cocaine. What? Just to be safe, you should probably stop sniffing your dollar bills. 90% of U.S. currency is tainted with cocaine. What a country. Also on michaelsavage.com, here's a nice article. A Muslim has been sentenced for his role in a plot to kill Jews and attack military bases. That's right, he's a Muslim. And yep, on the bottom of michaelsavage.com, as you guessed, Sotomayor joins the three liberals in her first Supreme Court vote. The new justice joined a dissent by three libs on the high court to try and stop the execution of a convicted murderer. The bum is scheduled to die this morning by lethal injection. Go to michaelsavage.com to read all about it. Play some music. It is the Savage Nation, the middle of August, late August already. Most normal people are on vacation. They're in psycho land, drunk every day. What are they doing on vacation? Sit in the room? What are they going out for ice every two? Ice. That is so 1950s, the bucket with the ice. Is that what you're supposed to do? Go go in a room and sit and drink whiskey? I don't get it. I mean, why go anywhere to do that? I, anyway, look, to each his own. I'm a tr- You know, in that regard, I'm really a libertarian. I've told you that I'm a sexual libertarian. I've said that a hundred times a, a week. But no one seems to hear me. I don't care what you do to stimulate your various body parts. As long as children are left alone and you stay away from marriage, I don't really care. That's all. How hard is that to figure out? So, what am I want to doing here? I'm sitting here drinking tea, doing a radio show. I have a cup. I have a tea. The cup is a naval cup with a wide bottom. I like naval items. Nautical and naval items are my my hobby, okay? This is a cup I got from a guy in Seattle. It says, daily flogging will continue until the crew's morale improves. There. That's interesting. Daily flogging will continue until the crew's morale improves. That's my idea of how to raise, uh, take a child out of being a junkie. Oh, how come you, why do they coddle them for? You throw the drugs out the window, you step on the hypodermic needle with your boot, and you throw the kid in the street, and that's all. Don't enable him. The, the first sign you gotta, you got to strike back, the first sign you strike back, the minute you coddle that child, you're, co- you're helping him become a junkie. The, the minute you coddle him and understand him, he's finished. You've ruined him. That is the world I am, uh, that's the world I was brought up in. I say it's too harsh for the world of today. You know, you may be right. I've been thinking about it. The world has changed. The society has changed. Take a look at what we have in the White House. Can you imagine a man like this in the White House 20 years ago? Impossible. How could so many people have fallen for this joker? How is it possible? All right, there were Democrats who were legitimate candidates who had experience and we knew who they were and, and with whom we could trust the country to hand it to them. I wouldn't have liked their policies necessarily, but I didn't have doubts about where they were born, where their loyalties lied. But this guy out of nowhere, he even beat the Hillary Clinton machine. How'd this happen? Uh, but that's neither here nor there. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Take a guy like Red Skelton. You may remember him, you may not. Played a clown, did a good job. I loved him as a kid, didn't know much about him. As it turned out, the man painted. He painted schlocky paintings of clowns. What did he paint? A thousand clown pictures? What was he trying to do? I thought about it the other day as a grown man. What do you think he was doing? He was trying to paint the clowns out of his own head. You see what I'm saying? In other words... There was a higher part of Red Skeleton. In order for him to perform at all, there had to be a a brilliant high element within him, something spiritually higher, right? To be a performer like that. Because he didn't use dirty words. He didn't uh, do anything with filthy, dirty language in order to get a laugh out of an audience. He actually used comedy to attract people, unlike the dirtbags on Showtime and HBO today. Every other word is F. Or MF, or F and MF, 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 
What'd you say? Muff, meff, meff, meff. What'd you say? Muff, meff. What'd you say? That's that's HBO's idea of comedy. Every other word, meff, 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 and that's not comedy. It's insanity. But Red Skelton didn't have to do that, so there was a higher element with him. But the clown he had to use inside himself to to hit those notes. But he was depressed that he had to be a clown to get the audience to listen. He probably would rather have been the higher element within himself. Does this make sense to you? See, painted clowns all his life, I think, to rid his mind of the clowns. You'd call them, what do they call them today? Everything they have a psychological word for, and they give you a drug to turn you into a, a, a Democrat. What was the, what would you call it today? The, the, not the ghost. In my day, they called it the shadow. Huh? No, 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 not, not psychological terms. So they say inner demons. Now, everything's an inner demon. In other words, everything that, that's a human being, oh, he's got an inner demon, take a pill, come back in three months, take another one. We'll see if that doesn't put down the psychosis. We'll give you another one. It'll create the psychosis. What inner demon? It's, it's inner selves. I recognize at age 18 through self-analysis for five straight years that <clears throat> if you peel away the onion and keep peeling away the onion of your own self, at the middle of it, you're going to find nothing. At the center of it all, there's nothing. So why peel anymore? So you pack the onion back up and you march forward and that's it. What are you looking for inside? There's nothing there. Hello? Keep knocking. Keep a knocking, but you can't come in. Do you have that song for me right now? Keep Because I know I'm going to get slammed now already with it. No, my God is within... Keep looking within and you'll find God within the center of yourself. All right. Yeah, I know. Jimmy Carter thought he met him in his living room because of the strychnine. I mean, that family drank enough strychnine for the guy to become the peacenik he is. You talk about the average person has nothing on the inside. The Jimmy Carter family with the strychnine and the snakes and seeing uh, his lord and master in the living room. I don't know what he was wearing. I don't know. Trousers, tweeds. Went away a, left me a tuxedo. Time ago. Who's this? Now you Keep a knocker, but you can't. Knocking. Now I grew up on like Argosy magazine. Gail Storm was a stripper. Who's Gail Storm? Turn it off. LBJ liked this kind of thing, didn't he? Whenever uh, Lady Bird wasn't around, he went down to the the booze it up down in New Orleans with the lady. Savage.